This conference will now be recorded. Welcome you all once again to Baby Critical Care 2020. Uh, we have discussed earlier about the preload responsiveness in critical care patients. It was well uh, presented by Dr. Dinesh. Uh, he has spoken about these static parameters, which are not doing much better at the bedside. So we have to go for the dynamic parameter, which should be very useful for the uh, to know whether the patient is fluid responsive or not fluid responsive. But when come to the uh, these dynamic parameters, we have several options. Like we have pulse pressure variation, which is very useful in case of a ventilated patient who is sedated or even relaxed patient, then it will be very useful. But when come to the patient who are having spontaneous breathing, there comes there are some problem. We have other option like passive leg raising test or end expert occlusion test or fluid challenge per se. It may be many fluid challenge or uh, um, uh, fluid challenge per se. But even if you consider these things like passive leg raising test, we have to know the uh, in uh, the change in the stroke volume or change in the cardiac output to know whether the patient is really fluid responsive or fluid responsive. So when ultimately we are, we are want to discuss on the whether the patient's cardiac output improves or not. So in that aspect, we have again to monitor how to monitor cardiac out, uh, output and uh, and uh, even with the uh, invasive uh, monitoring as well as non-invasive monitoring, maybe Dr. Dinesh is going to highlight. Dr. Dinesh Kumar is MD, DM, a PDCC cardiac anesthesiologist, JS Medical Institute, Mysore. He is having a very uh, vast experience in managing uh, patient with using this cardiac output monitors as well as the difficulty in managing cardiac output also. So we will request, uh, uh, we welcome Dr. Dinesh again and also a request to hand over uh, for the proceeding. I will stop my share, sharing screen now. I request Dr. Dinesh to proceed. Hello. Yes, sir, audible. Hello. Sir. Uh, at the outset, I would yes, sir, yes, Raghunath sir. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, ICCM Mysore chapter and Dr. Raghunath sir for giving me an opportunity to present uh, the today's webinar on uh, cardiac output monitoring. So, cardiac output is mounted, which is pumped by the heart per minute, and uh, it's a stroke volume in heart rate. So, is the volume of blood pumped by for each beat so on an average around five liters so it has Dr. to mix with the body surface here ha sir sorry oh, share oh. the screen can you share the slides uh, can you give me one more uh, link sir yes sir it's given you can directly share the screen <clears throat> Is it seen now? No, sir. Not Please tap on the screen button. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah. Now? Now I am am I yes, visible sir. now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. You can proceed, sir. So Please at the show, outset, please. I would like to yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, lagging just a minute sir uh, cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood which is pumped by the heart in each minute it's given by stroke volume into heart rate stroke volume is the amount of blood which is pumped by per beat so on an average, uh, it's around five liter, but it has to be indexed with body surface area, which can uh, the cardiac index may vary from 2.8 to 4.9 liters per um, minute, minute per meter square. 
so in the last uh, presentation i stressed why cardiac output is important which was also given importance in the last uh, webinar on shock that cardiac output is a very important factor in managing patients with uh, stroke shock who doesn't respond to the initial fluid challenge so the cardiac output is an important factor in uh, establishing the oxygen delivery it's an important determinant of oxygen delivery which in turn is determined by the stroke volume and heart rate and stroke volume is dependent on preload afterload and contractility as we discussed in the previous webinar so traditionally to assess cardiac output we are using peripheral pulses if it is uh, very thready and uh, the peripheral temperature are cold then we call the patient in maybe in shock then uh, blood pressure which is nothing but cardiac output into systemic vascular resistance and uh, urine output because 20% of the cardiac output is used for renal perfusion if there is a good urine output previously we used to think that patient may be having a good cardiac output and uh, various uh, end results like abg showing acidosis and central venous saturation the lactate levels have been used to assess the cardiac output but when we want to measure the cardiac output directly the monitors have been classified as calibrated and non calibrated calibrated are the one which has got a very good precision means they can whenever they are repeated it gives very accurate results and they are very accurate also so based upon the invasiveness it can be invasive less invasive and non invasive so here i have listed various methods fix method indicator dilution methods where you can use a dye like indocyanin green or a radio isotope which is more of uh, limited to the labs rather than clinically they are not used thermo dilution where temperature is used as an indicator it can be a bolus or a continuous method and uh, litco where lithium is used as an indicator then uh, based on the pulse contour we have pico then transpulmonary thermo dilution and esophageal doppler eco bio impedance or bio reactance and partial carbon dioxide rebreathing techniques these are the various uh, monitors available and in brief i am going to discuss each one of them way back in 19th century it was adolf fick who introduced the law of diffusion and called as fick's law of diffusion and he was the first one to develop a technique to measure cardiac output and fix equation is based on the concept that the oxygen consumed by the tissue per unit time is equal to the amount of oxygen which is extracted per unit time from the circulation so vo2 is equal to arterial oxygen content minus venous oxygen content into cardiac output if you rearrange the formula you will get that if you know the oxygen consumption per minute and arterial and venous oxygen content we can derive the cardiac output but uh, the limitations are errors in sampling and analysis and difficulty in obtaining the oxygen uptake continuously in the or as well as in the icu because of the bulky equipments which are surrounding the endotracheal tube and inability to maintain a steady state hemodynamics and respiratory condition so then what we have is an indicator dilution techniques for a known amount of indicator if it is introduced at one point in the circulation and if the indicator is not metabolized and there is no arteriovenous shunt across the tissue then the same amount of indicator should be detectable at the downstream point this is the main principle so the amount of indicator detected at the downstream point is equal to the product of cardiac output and the change in the indicator concentration over time which is given by the stuart hamilton's equation where cardiac output is equal to the amount of indicator injected into 60 divided by the the concentration of the indicator and time the area under that curve so cold saline which is the most commonly used in thermo dilution technique and lithium ions are used as indicators dyes mainly in the labs and radio isotopes whenever you do a nuclear study this can be used so first i will be dealing with thermo dilution technique which is the gold standard still now it is very commonly used in patients who are undergoing cardiac surgery though there are several uh, literature doesn't say that with the use of pa catheter it is going to improve the uh, outcome of the patient 
so first you have to have you have to secure a nine front sheath in a large vein we prefer the internal jugular vein because it's in straight line with the svc and then into the ra so once a nine front sheath is secured pa catheter is introduced into the sheath so once it reaches 20 centimeters we inflate the balloon this uh, balloon will float with the blood and travel with the blood and uh, we also transduce the in the proximal tip can measure the pressure so we'll transduce that we'll get the waveform by changing the waveform we'll identify how far the catheter tip has traveled so as we see now the balloon is inflated so it now passes through the ra so we can see the waveforms which are similar to cvp acv waves then it goes through the tricuspid valve and enters the rv usually between 30 to 35 centimeters it has to enter the rv so you can see the pressure waveform there is a systolic upstroke which indicates that it has entered the rv by 40 to 45 it has to reach the pa so once it reached the across pulmonary valve now it is entering the pa so you can see there is a diastolic step up which indicates that it's in the pulmonary artery so as the balloon floats and reaches the distal pulmonary arteries it gets wedged where you see the waveforms very much similar to cvp but will be at a higher pressure because la pressures are between 12 to 15 so once you deflate the curve you get the waveform which are similar to pa and to reinflate, it will again go and get wedged and gives the waveform similar to CVP, the left sided pressures. And uh, this is about uh, the PA catheter. So, now how to calculate the bolus cardiac output using saline, where we are using temperature as an indicator and it is based on the Stuart Hamilton's equation. So this is the PA catheter. These are the proximal inject port. If you inject cold saline, it comes out into the RA and it changes the temperature of the blood, which is traversing the RV and the PA. And the change in temperature is recorded by the thermistor, which is located at the tip of the catheter. And this is the curve and cardiac output is inversely proportional to the area under this curve. This is intermittent technique. And as we are, uh, one person is injecting the saline. So the amount of saline injected and the temperature and the rate of injection is very much dependent on the operator. So to eliminate this, we came up with continuous uh, output monitoring, which I will show in my next slide. So bolus of uh, cold fluid is injected into the RA and change in temperature detected by the thermistor and is based on the modified Stuelton Hamilton's equation, where cardiac output is equal to the volume of the injected and uh, initial blood temperature, the initial injected temperature, K1 is the density factors, and K2 is the computational constant. This depends upon the what type of fluid we are injecting. Usually we use normal saline or 5% dextrose, and uh, the constants are given in the website and uh, it is divided by the integral of the blood temperature change over time and a computer that integrates the area under the temperature versus time curve is used to perform the calculation and cardiac output is inversely proportional to this area under the curve so to eliminate the operator dependency they came up with continuous cardiac output monitoring where in this the pa catheter has a thermal filament which is placed on the catheter usually it will be in the R ra and uh, once the monitor is activated the computer is on and uh, it warms the thermal filament and changes the temperature of the blood which is traversing through the ra and rv so this change in temperature is in turn detected by the thermistor which is located at the tip of catheter so intermittently it is switching on and off and it is warming the blood which is traversing so this change in temperature is detected by the thermistor which is located at the tip of the catheter when these two curves are equated we'll get a similar curve as we saw in the thermodilution technique 
and this area under this curve is proportional to cardiac output so this is using pa catheter and uh, using thermodilution technique continuous cardiac output monitoring so various uh, hemodynamic parameters can be derived using pa catheter that is cardiac output when it is indexed to body surface area it is a, about 2.8 to 4.2 liters per minute per meter square you can get stroke volume left ventricular stroke work index right ventricular stroke work systemic vascular resistance which is the afterload which is a very important factor in managing patients with shock whether to give vasodilators vasopressors and uh, is it normal whether to increase the contractility or whether to give preload afterload can be very much decided based upon these factors pulmonary vascular resistance and it gives us an uh, various oxygen delivery parameters like arterial oxygen content mixed oxygen saturation and oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption can also be calculated so the limitations are in patients who are having tricuspid regurgitation means uh, the blood from the rv is travel instead of going into pa it is going into the R ra so it underestimates the cardiac output if you are giving iv fluids through the pa line which are very, which is very cold it may alter the calculations if you inject uh, the cold saline very rapidly it may stimulate the sinus node and patient's heart rate may come down and falsely it may show that the cardiac output is low the volume and speed of injection is very much important when you are doing intermittent but continuous all these factors can be wavered and uh, using pa catheter we are uh, mainly calculating the right sided cardiac output and uh, majority of the time we assume that uh, the left sided cardiac output if patient is having a valvular heart disease for example mitral regurgitation or an aortic regurgitation where the blood from the lv is traversing back to la or into the lv back then the cardiac output may be different the left sided and the right sided cardiac output so these factors have to be kept in mind and there are many complications which are associated with the pa catheter if balloon is remaining inflated for a very long time it may cause a very deadly complication pulmonary hemorrhage then patient may end up in uh, lobectomies that's a important complication patients who are having lvbb if you put a pa catheter they are at an increased risk of developing complete heart block it may injure the various structures inside while uh, floating if you balloon is not properly inflated and uh, it may induce arrhythmias also especially when we are entering into the rv so all these things have to be kept in mind when we are using pa catheter so next we have is uh, lithium litco lithium chloride is used as an indicator in which uh, 150 millimoles of lithium chloride is injected either through a central line or a peripheral venous catheter there is a lithium sensitive selective electrode which is in the arterial cannula and it measures the lithium concentration over time curve and cardiac output is calculated as lithium dose into 60 divided by the area which is under the curve the concentration time curve into 1 minus the packed cell volume as lithium is distributed only in the plasma not in the rbc or wbc we have to subtract it in the first pass circulation and this dose of lithium doesn't have any pharmacological action but it is contraindicated in patients who are in on lithium especially psychiatric and bipolar disorders and patients uh, if you give a neuromuscular blocking agent the ammonium ion which is located will interfere with the sensing electrode so the calibration has to be done before induction in patients whom you are using neuromuscular blockers and uh, litco plus is combined with uh, lithium as a litco uh, lithium dye indication method as well as pulse contour and it can give cardiac output continuously based first initial calibration is done with uh, lithium uh, and then the cardiac output is measured using pulse contour and it calculates uh, the cardiac output continuously and this is called as litco plus so pico is uh, based on the arterial pressure waveform that is uh, the systolic part of the arterial pressure waveform is proportional to pulse pressure 
and that is proportional to stroke volume. So this area is used to calculate in PICO based upon this formula, which is patient specific calibration factor heart rate into area under the pressure curve and aortic compliance, which is calculated by the demographic variables and uh, the shape of the pressure curve. So PICO mainly it is a pulse contour. So any alteration in the pulse contour, for example, patient is having any arrhythmias or patient is in shock, there is peripheral vasoconstriction or patient is having a valvular heart disease, the shape of the arterial waveform is altered. So it may not record the cardiac output accurately in all patient. So we have to see in which subset of patients we can use PICO. So next is the flow track, which is uh, available in most of the hospital and it's very simple. If you just have an arterial line, you can calculate the cardiac output and it also gives stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, which are important in fluid management as it was discussed before. So based on the, the arterial pressure waveform characteristics, it calculates the cardiac output and uh, this is the formula based on which the flow track calculates pulse rate into standard deviation of the arterial blood pressure into Z factor. And standard deviation of the arterial blood pressure is proportional to pulse pressure and it is computed on beat to beat basis. And uh, Z factor compensates for the difference in the vascular compliance and resistance. That is patient to patient difference estimated from the biometric data. You have to enter the height, weight, and uh, the body surface area of the patient is calculated from which it derives. And dynamic changes are estimated by the waveform, that is arterial waveform analysis, and it is measured as ml per beat per millimeters of mercury. And uh, this is a very simple monitor, but uh, in patients who are very unstable, patients who are on a lot of vasoactive drugs, patients who are on IABP, if patients is having a valvular heart disease, then patients with arrhythmias, this uh, flow track monitor doesn't work. So when you are de-resuscitating or patient is uh, stable with uh, on a mechanical ventilator sedated and he's not having any arrhythmias, this method can be used to calculate the cardiac output. So it also gives stroke volume variation, which is important in managing fluids. So next, uh, coming to echocardiography, which is uh, most important, it's a less invasive method and uh, it is based on the volumetric flow at any point in time equals to the blood flow velocity times the cross-sectional area. So if you have an area, if you know the cross-sectional area of that area and the velocity at that point, if you multiply both, it will give us the cardiac output. This is the main principle. To calculate the stroke volume, the instantaneous velocity during systole are traced from the spectral display. And there is an internal software which calculates the velocity time integral. If you multiply velocity time integral into cross-sectional area, you will get the stroke volume. Into heart rate, you will get the cardiac output. So conceptually what exactly VTI velocity time integral means is it is the distance traveled by the red cell with each systolic ejection. So when the stroke distance is multiplied by the cross sectional area of the conduit through which the blood has traveled, the stroke volume is obtained and into heart rate, you will get the cardiac output. So most commonly what we use is LVOT or RVOT because they are more easy to calculate because there is no alteration in the shape of this uh, conduit with systole and diastole. Their area remains the same. And it is very easy to align the Doppler using either transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography to across the LVOT or RVOT. So that's why LVOT is the most preferred one. So these are the transesophageal views and this is mid esophageal aortic valve long axis view and uh, the most important is it is the area is calculated by the formula 2 pi r square so any me measurement if it goes wrong with the radius measurement it gets squared so you have to be very careful so first thing is you have to take a zoomed view and you have to take a frame 
in mid systole when both the leaflets of the aortic valve are parallel and you have to measure the diameter 1 cm below the aortic valve so once you measure the lvot diameter it gives the lvot area then you have to take the transgastric view that is uh, aortic valve long axis view if you are using a transthoracic echo you can take an apical four chamber view just tilt the probe cordially so lvot opens up you will get a five chamber view then put a pulse wave doppler across it and uh, get a spectral doppler like this if you trace the this all these instantaneous velocities are added to get the vti so vti into cross sectional area will give you the cardiac output and that will give you the stroke volume when it is multiplied with heart rate it gives the cardiac output so in this patient it's just 1.6 liters per minute is the cardiac output which is very low so this is a video to show how do you calculate I'm sorry. So mid is phage diode well short is view. So this is a I would well long x view. So you take a frame, select the frame in uh, stall where the leaflets are parallel. I think video is uh, lacking a bit. So this is how you measure the LVOT diameter. So this is how you calculate the LVOT diameter. And the LVOT diameter will get a LVOT. Area. So this is our transgastric aortic valve losses. So you put a cursor in the LOT. Use a pulse wave because uh, if you use continuous wave, all the velocities will be picked up. So pulse wave doppler should be used and get a spectral doppler like this and select a spectral doppler which is uniform and uh, then you go to the formula and uh, trace the, in the spectral doppler. Once you trace the cell droplet, you will get a VTI, which is seen in this patient. Then you have to give the RR number from one systolic ejection to another systolic ejection if you measure. So it will give the heart rate. And uh, that will calculate the cardiac output, which was uh, 3 liters in this patient. So, using echocardiography, mainly it is uh, less invasive, but uh, it requires some amount of skill and training. And uh, any errors, especially in calculating, measuring the LVOT area or alignment of the Doppler, Doppler has to be parallel to the flow. So, it can result in uh, erroneous estimation of uh, cardiac output. And it cannot be done continuously, so it has to be done intermittently only. So you can't measure cardiac output using echocardiography uh, continuously. Then came uh, esophageal Doppler, which is a standard esophageal stethoscope. So you insert up to 35 centimeters. It lies between T5, T6 vertebral interspace. And uh, it has mounted at a fixed angle but uh, it calculates the flow only in the descending thoracic aorta so only a fraction of the total cardiac output is calculated so there is a correction factor of 1.4 and a mode is used to calculate uh, 
the area of the descending thoracic aorta based upon the age, sex, height, and weight of the patient using nomograms. So this is the esophageal Doppler, and uh, from the descending thoracic aorta, uh, it calculates the cardiac output. But all the bump blood which has been pumped into the brain and upper limbs are not being used to calculate. So you need to multiply it 1.4 times. And uh, this is the VTI. So if you trace that, you'll get the VTI. Then that into cross-sectional area of the descending thoracic aorta will give you stroke volume. If you multiply that with heart rate, you'll get cardiac output. So other uh, non-invasive methods are uh, bioimpedance cardiac output monitoring. It was uh, Cubic and uh, colleagues who devised it, and it is based on the change in electrical imp impedance of the thoracic cavity, which occurs with the ejection of blood during a cardiac systole. So blood is supposed to be electrically active. So it is the stroke volume is calculated as the P is the specific resistivity of the blood, L is the thoracic length, and uh, basal thoracic impedance into ventricular rejection time and the maximum rate of impedance change during systole. Two, it is done is four electrodes are there. It is placed on both the sides of the neck and the lower part of the thorax and a continuous small electrical current is applied across the chest and patient height, weight and gender are used to calculate the approximate volume of the thoracic cavity. And bioimpedance, the change in the bioimpedance with the movement of blood is used to compute the stroke volume and cardiac output. So bioimpedance cardiac output is computed with each cardiac cycle and it is continuously displaced and it gives an average over several beats. It is non-invasive and uh, it is very simple. It can be used to calculate the cardiac output. But there are many shortcomings. This is how a monitor bioimpedance cardiac output monitor looks like. These are the leads which are placed across the neck as well as at the lower part of the thorax. Many studies suggest that uh, bioimpedance method is accurate in healthy volunteers, but its reliability deteriorates in critically ill patients, including those with uh, sepsis increased mainly because of there is uh, the the fluid volume inside the thoracic cavity will get altered in all these critically ill patients. Either the lung water will increase or they, there is a pleural effusion or these patients uh, uh, may have uh, uh, aortic regurgitation and uh, if there is an uh, electronic cardiac pacing also, this uh, bioimpedance method does not uh, record the cardiac output. But in cardiac surgery, we, because of the sternotomy, we can't use at all. So I don't have much experience of uh, using bioimpedance technique. So it is very much dependent on the thoracic fluid composition. That is, if there is pleural effusion, extra vascular lung water increases, then this may not be accurate in that subset of patients. Then we have a partial carbon dioxide rebreathing cardiac output monitoring. This came into OB mainly because of the difficulty in calculating the oxygen consumption and uh, maintaining a stable uh, metabolic rate. So what they did was instead of uh, oxygen, they have used uh, VC means carbon dioxide. The amount of carbon dioxide produced uh, divided by the venous carbon dioxide minus the arterial oxygen content will give us the cardiac output. Mainly the change in the carbon dioxide production and the change in the entitled CO2 concentration in response to a brief sudden change in minute ventilation is used to calculate the cardiac output. And uh, there is a specially designed breathing system and a computer that measures and it can be used only in intubated patient. Every three minutes, a computer controlled pneumatic valve is intermittently it gets closed and it increases the dead space for about 50 seconds period, causing partial rebreathing of the exhaled gases. This in turn changes the entitled CO2 in response to rebreathing and it is used to calculate by the differential version of the fixed principle. So this is how the, the circuit look and the ventilatory circuit or an anesthesia machine is connected. This is the rebreathing loop and uh, this is the capnostat which analyzes and uh, there is a valve over here, rebreathing valve, which gets closed. So patients rebreathe the amount of air within this for about 50 seconds. And the change in the CO2 concentration is used to calculate. And this is how a NECO machine looks like. 
so advantage is it's non invasive and uh, every few minutes you can calculate the cardiac output and brief periods of uh, rebreathing there is not much substantial risk to most of the patient because etco to raises by only 3 mm but uh, limitations are it can be done only in intubated patients and changing pattern of ventilation may have unpredictable influence on this uh, measurement so clinical trials are very small and mainly focused on specific patient groups primarily focused on short term intraoperative applications or on mechanically ventilated post operative patients but if patient is having pulmonary edema ards pneumonia or there is uh, systemic venous shunts all these will influence uh, the amount of co2 which is generated so it may not be accurate in this subset of patients then we have ecom that is conmed ecom which is endotracheal cardiac output monitoring and it is based on the principle that the electrical resistance of blood changes when it moves or change in volume and blood is a charged solution and pumping of blood by the left ventricle causes uh, fluid motion and volume changes in the ascending aorta therefore by sending a current through the ascending aorta and by measuring the change in the resistance one can deduce the amount of blood being pumped mainly the the close the bronchus and the ascending aorta are very close and that relationship is built. and uh, this how an uh, endotracheal tube cuff of an ecom these are the electrodes through which uh, electricity is passed through the, the the bronchus and then into the ascending aorta mainly the clo close proximity of bronchus and ascending aorta are used and uh, you can see that uh, this is the endotracheal tube which lies just above the bronchus and this is the ascending aorta and this how the ecom monitor looks and uh, this is the cardiac output which is calculated by the ecom monitor so this how it has evolved from uh, 1970 schwann's gans pulmonary artery catheter to flow track in 2005 and in 2010 we have got the volume view system and later on lot of non invasive methods have come so this is the volume view system which gives uh, the cardiac output as well as the dynamic variables of uh, fluid management so as i showed it in the previous presentation uh, a saline, <coughs> saline is injected through the central line and uh, it goes through the right side of the heart then the lungs and then it comes out uh, through the left to the aorta then the change in temperature is measured in the femoral arterial catheter so it requires a central line and arterial line and it is based on transpulmonary thermodilution technique this is how the cardiac output is uh, calculated the area under this curve will represent the cardiac output and uh, this is uh, transpulmonary thermodilution technique so i said uh, it gives both the uh, dynamic as well as uh, static variables so stroke volume variation cvp and it gives after load svr and uh, it gives us an idea about ejection fraction also so the contractility can also be made out <coughs> other important factor is extravascular lung water and pul pulmonary vascular permeability index can also be known so these are very important in patients uh, critically ill patients who are whom we are managing in the icu so several uh, non invasive pulse contour technique <coughs> have come in and uh, these technique uh, still needs lot of validation uh, with uh, randomized control trials <coughs> this is a clear sight uh, monitor and it can be uh, connected to the ev1000 and it is based on a applanation tonometry means uh, this how there is an inflated uh, bladder and this is connected to the fingers these are the digital vessels and uh, this is the light source and light detector so based on applanation tonometry this cuff inflates and calculate the blood pressure that is uh, mean arterial pressure then using photoplethysmography it uh, that is pulse oximetry similar principle it uses and calculates the pulse wave the area under this uh, arterial pulse wave is used to calculate the stroke volume from which uh, the cardiac output is derived so this how the stroke volume is calculated this is the 
the area under the systolic uh, portion of the blood pressure curve that is uh, systolic pressure time divided by the after load which is calculated uh, based on the age gender height and weight of the patient and the waveform of the arterial pulse trace so stroke volume is systolic pressure time divided by the after load and uh, we have seen app which is a continuous uh, non invasive arterial pressure so this is the same nibp cuff which is used to calculate the blood pressures and these are the cuff which are placed around the digits and uh, it calculates uh, the system and the blood pressures <coughs> as well as the stroke volume cardiac output based on the pulse rate <coughs> and uh, this also gives us a variation <clears throat> an idea about pulse pressure variation which is important with uh, regard to fluid management and uh, all these uh, systems which are uh, mainly calculating on the pulse waveform the trace of the pulse waveform so patients who are in uh, shock may have uh, maybe on vasoactive drugs there may be vasoconstriction peripheral vasoconstriction and uh, these patients if they are having any arrhythmias also and uh, patients with valvular heart disease because uh, there may be alteration in the trace of this pulse so all these things may not be accurate and uh, these are the newer methods which are less uh, non invasive so in stable patients uh, whom we are de resuscitating it can be used but uh, all these needs to be validated and uh, they are in the market so ultrasonic cardiac output monitoring this is based on the flow velocity in the aorta and pulmonary outflow tracts and this uses a pre calculated area of the pulmonary valve or aortic valve so this may not be accurate in elderly patients and patients who are having valvular heart there may be alteration in the valve area and patient may have aortic sclerosis because of that valve area may be altered but uh, it has got a very short learning curve so this is also been used but it needs to be validated ultrasonic cardiac output monitoring so that's about uh, the various types available so the gold standard is still the pa catheter which can be intermittent or continuous but uh, it can also gives various other parameters the oxygen derivatives as well as uh, hemodynamic parameters which are important but it is very invasive and there are complications which are associated with the pa catheter those studies have not shown that it is going to improve the mortality or the outcome but any monitoring will not change the mortality unless it is mainly determined by the what type of treatment we are giving so we have less invasive methods like transpulmonary thermodilution pulse contour pulse pressure variation and the newer ones are the nico that is partial C CO2 rebreathing techniques. So, so NICO can be used only in sedated and ventilated patients and uh, esophageal Doppler, then ECHO. Uh, ECHO is uh, more of operator dependent. So one should have the skill. It is expensive, but it is nowadays uh, routinely ECHO is available in all the ICUs. So once you have an ECHO, so you should, uh, with training, one should be able to calculate the cardiac output accurately. And uh, if you can't get the good images, then you can use transesophageal echo. So even American Society of Echocardiography has given a class 1A recommendation for treating patients who are hemodynamically unstable, not responding to the initial fluid recitation. So it is a class 1A recommendation by American Society of Echocardiography to use echo to measure the cardiac output. Then you have several non-invasive methods like clear sight, CNAP. All these are uh, less accurate in clear critically ill patients. It needs to be validated. Then bioimpedance and uh, ultrasonic cardiac output monitoring. They are also been being used. So they all needs to be validated. And uh, mainly operator dependent. So once uh, if we develop a skill, then we can use. So from this uh, talk, the message I would like to convey is cardiac output monitoring is very important in managing patients who are critically ill, especially those with shock and uh, not responding to initial fluid recitation. 
in those patients whether you want to give more fluids or whether you are going to use vasodilators or vasopressors or whether you want to increase the contractility all these can be made out uh, with echo as well as cardiac output monitoring and uh, cardiac output is nothing but uh, stroke volume into heart rate it's an important determinant of uh, tissue oxygenation so it has to be optimized in all critically ill patient and still pa catheter and thermodilution is the gold standard so you have echo bio impedance nico and several other non invasive methods to measure the cardiac output calibrated techniques uh, offer the best uh, precision and accuracy so better to use one which is been calibrated relying on non calibrated techniques uh, can prove difficult in critically ill patients because of the rapidly changing conditions in uh, preload the vasomotor tone and cardiac function so you may end up with uh, misleading calculations inappropriate medical management under or over resuscitation of the patient and uh, pulse contour analysis it's useful it uh, gives us an idea about uh, the dynamic variables this is a stroke volume pulse pressure variation so in sy patients who are in sinus rhythm we can be and uh, ventilated patient it can be used so we recommend using calibrated techniques in the critically ill and unstable patient preferably less invasive techniques and uh, pulmonary artery catheter is preferred in patients who are having significant myocardial dysfunction and uh, there is right heart failure or pulmonary hypertension pa catheter may be very useful because you can get the right sided parameters and uh, de resuscitate the patient as and when needed you have to every day evaluate whether this monitor is required or not once you are using and then come down from uh, invasive to less invasive to non invasive and non invasive technique can be combined with uh, echocardiography to provide valuable additional information i would like to thank everyone for a patient hearing and i would be happy to answer any questions hello uh, thank you dr dinesh yes sir yeah uh, it was a fantastic uh, presentation actually uh, uh, the the difficult things has made very easy to understand uh, dr dinesh thank you sir. dinesh can you, you come out of the uh, screen share yes so sir. that we can yeah Uh, it was really a, a good uh, presentation uh, so most of the difficult things are made very easy actually and i think only dr dinesh can do this job <laughs> because very difficult to understand uh, no, nothing cardiac like that sir uh, cardiac output understanding itself is very difficult and when interpreting the data also it is not so easy so i will i i request all the attendees to Uh, i request all the attendees uh, if any question they can put in the chat box or even they can open up camera and they can ask uh, uh, we we now we know that uh, this uh, uh, pulmonary artery catheter coming to non non invasive monitoring of cardiac output uh, the most important thing in routinely bedside is the echocardiography so uh, to the echo Uh, calculating stroke volume and as well as cardiac output is very useful in while that dinesh also was uh, discussing that fact uh, that time but there was some video uh, disturbance was there so i request dr uh, guru prasad uh, dr guru prasad you are here sir i am here i am here yeah dr yeah, guru sir. prasad he is consult intensivist uh, from chirayu uh, hospital gadag thank you dr guru prasad being here i uh, we thought uh, uh, one demonstration for the uh, calculating stroke volume in one patient i request dr guru prasad to share his uh, video then we'll have a discussion with the attendees yeah. share, uh, will you please give me the share screen one second sir yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yes you can you can see that yes sir sharing is yes, on sir. okay yes sir we can yeah. see it yeah 
okay this is how uh, we do a stroke uh, volume measurement first what we do is uh, we take a, a, a parasonal long axis view uh, freeze the uh, screen then uh, zoom that part where the lvot is there as dr dinesh said uh, then we have to measure the uh, lvot diameter just at the aortic annulus okay well, once we do that this is a calculation which will be done by the uh, uh, ultrasound machine only you have to just uh, uh, put it as an lvot diameter then what we can do is we have to go for the four chamber and then the five chamber view the five chamber view is nothing but uh, the uh, you can see the uh, lvot and the aortic valves that is when you move the uh, transthoracic probe once you get a four good four chamber view you have to move it little bit separate when the fifth chamber opens so that's how the aortic uh, valve can be seen so there you have to place uh, the pulse wave doppler and the sample volume should be at the lvot exactly at the place where you had taken the lvot diameter that is very important then uh, you will get a, a, a wave like this doppler wave like this and you have to calculate the vti you have to uh, uh, draw a graph uh, draw a line along the uh, vti uh, doppler so once uh, that is done the machine calculates uh, the vti as well as uh, it calculates the uh, you can see the lvot diameter and uh, here you can see the stroke volume which has been displayed so uh, one systole to another systole if you mark you will get the heart rate and you will get the cardiac output and if we have entered the um, uh, body uh, the height and the weight then we will get a uh, cardiac index also this is how we have to calculate a lvot uh, vti which will help you in uh, getting the stroke volume hope i am clear uh, raghu yes sir yes sir it's very clear sir yeah okay thank you dr guru prasad sir thank you thank you uh yes sir, you can come out of the screen sir yeah. stop saving the screen. any questions from the uh, audience please uh, dr dinesh sir sir hello dr dinesh sir, sir uh, we are using the yes, pulmonary sir, artery yeah. catheter uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a even those studies have shown like a fac trial escape trial and pacman trial these are the trials which is have a negative trials with the pa catheter but most of the time it use a very good data it is now how to interpret those data are more important. Our seniors are using very effectively the PA catheter. Somehow we are not using much, so we are unable to use effectively that PA catheter. That is how I we want to interpret that part. So, but we should know the PA catheter, what data it will give, how it will be helpful and all. So uh, the all the students especially, we should know how it is very useful. But nowadays it is we are not used routinely because of the risk of arrhythmias, side uh, problems related to PA catheter per se. Uh, have you using now also sir, swan gans catheter uh, dr dinesh are you using now uh, we are still using catheters in cardiac set is one of the most thing especially to undergoing pulmonary surgery so what we have present no intermittent thermodynamic so we are using PA catheter, uh, we have in our practical and inside experience it is useful to change uh, the mortality or the outcome of the patient using Sorry to interrupt, the audio is not clear, sir. Uh, you can just check. Ah. Yes, sir. When your voice is breaking, so I am able to hear. The question is, still using PA catheter? Yes. Are yeah, we are using. We are using, especially now, um, current CBG surgery, and uh, it is to 
we get especially decided pressures and, uh, we are using it okay uh, thank you sir thank you so much uh, the what is the difference uh, in technology in uh, pico versus flow track both are same or different pico versus flow track versus flow track i couldn't properly sir uh, pico versus, uh, pico versus flow track. are all uh, based on condor so patients uh, who are remotely un if you are active and uh, who are having intraoperative pump if there is alar heart disease all these are going to alt form they perform these conditions uh, are going to there will be so more the cardiac output what you are measuring this cover in a uh, sinus mechanical well sedated you can use fuck is it you just secure an artery uh, into the vessels and zero the pain and put the artery it calculate the potential stroke volume wave but if you echo and the operator is uh, and uh, train to the cardiac correctly far more superior than uh, float but um, can give you in his card output man echo can give you only currently have yes uh, output monitoring using it okay uh, thank you dr dinesh what is your routine yes. uh, Yeah, what is your routine uh, monitoring system with respect to cardiac output in your day-to-day practice? Ah, uh, please read. It was a in your work. Yeah, the day-to-day practice. type day-to-day of practice. cardiac output monitoring used. Yes, yes. The uh, cardiograph. What uh, our favorite digit? So especially in off-pump surgery, we get a very cost around so it can cost so if at all if it's indicated using pa that is especially patients uh, who are having uh, acute for mi so these patients patients who are having very low vision and uh, patients uh, with complicated coronary artery by surgery we are using pas where we anticipate patient to lot of long time in the icu set of patient using the catheters only day to day we are go cardiography to assess the cardiac output and optimize uh, thank you dr dinesh uh, sir uh, there was some yeah uh, there was uh, uh, maybe the bandwidth is very low uh, there is a, a bit lag is there now only but the presentation came out very well a uh, lot of uh, things we thank you sir. from thank your project thank you so much uh, the message was very clear actually yeah uh, uh, pa catheter in expert is maybe still helpful but we are not using at the bed side most of the time we can use if arterial line is there we can use the flow track if you have if that is also not there we can use echocardiography as dr guru prasad was uh, demonstrated is very easy to ma- ma- calculate uh, cardiac output so we have to practice yes. every day to man, man, measure the stroke volume cardiac output from 2d echo if nothing no other uh, you know uh, uh, gadgets are available then echo we can use to get the uh, cardiac output and also for the fluid resuscitation per se whenever we are doing even uh, passive leg raising test or uh, any other t- uh, test we can use echo with the respect to stroke volume variation or cardiac output variation we can give fluid according to the uh, values if this with the patient is fluid responsive so that is message is very clear uh, and also dr dinesh has spoken and when concluded concluded the three slides are very important those three slides uh, whole uh, you know preload response in and cardiac output everything is explained in one three slides dr the last three slides are very 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 yes. important so uh, i request dr dinesh to Uh, you know those uh, slides will be given. We were put in the uh, our group, 
as well as in this link, webinar link also will be put in the links for the benefit of the students. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dinesh, once yes, again. Sir. If any queries we will discuss in the group, so that same thing, whatever question I will ask again there, please respond because th this time you are not able to yes, audibly or uh, not clear. So we can answer yes, there also. Thank you so much, sir, Dr. Dinesh. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much thank for your valuable time. Thank you. And thank you all the attendees. Thank uh, you. Sir. Thank so that uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Guru Prasad sir, thank you, sir, for your valuable time. Always, 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 Raghu, always for you. Okay. <laughs> thank you.